Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Alice Samson, Assistant Professor at Nalsar University of Law. This paper is African and Caribbean writing. The module today will give an introduction to Caribbean and African prose. Before beginning, let us look at an overview of the module. The lesson will introduce some of the key authors who have attempted to theorize literary production from the African Caribbean world. The aim of the lesson is to provide an overarching survey of the prose produced in English from African and Caribbean and deal in detail with the works of a few authors and discuss their chief concepts. Module 1 – Introduction to African Prose Africa, the world's second largest continent, enjoys diverse topography and is inhabited by thousands of tribes. Since the turn of the 16th century, various European countries including Portugal, Spain, Holland, France and England vied with one another to colonize various parts of Africa. In the 19th century, the new imperialist powers including Prussia, Germany, Italy and United States vied to establish colonies in Africa. Though Africa, like most parts of the third world, was a victim of colonialism. It is no exaggeration to say that the most heinous crimes of colonialism were committed in Africa. The colonial powers subjected the local population to violent subjugation, used coercive modes to traffic millions of humans as slaves, completely ravaged the human and natural resources on the continent, and systematically tried to eliminate the cultural diversity of the continent. As the new imperialist powers sought more territory in Africa, the continent witnessed several bloody battles. To avert wars amongst themselves, the European powers under the chairmanship of the German Otto van Bismarck met in Berlin in 1884 and 1885. The fallout of the conference was that the European powers, seeking to end the territorial wars in Africa, agreed to divide the continent among themselves. In their efforts to reach a consensus, Europeans disregarded the fact that Africa was a land of immense cultural diversity where several tribes existed either as independent or as autonomous political entities. Such a political arrangement between the European nations besides aiding the rampant exploitation of natural resources in Africa, also disallowed the growth of nationalism in the colonies. Unlike the other parts of the world, the anti-colonial struggles that were waged in Africa did not create strong waves of nationalism. This was due to the fact that African countries were inhabited by diverse tribes which often fought with each other. In many cases, countries a tribe was divided among different countries. Among Africans, the affiliation to the tribe was always stronger than the association with the nation. A tribe which is divided across several countries often fought for its unification and demanded an exclusive territory for itself. This tendency among the African tribes led to severe civil war in several countries. Africa has been fraught with the issues of race, tribe and religion. Africa witnessed massive relocation of human beings in the 20th century. East coast of Africa housed several communities that relocated from South Asia and West Asia. In the South Africa and Zimbabwe, Europeans established several settlements and within a span of two centuries spawned a significant white population in these countries. The white population which was in a minority, continued to govern the native population even after these countries assumed their independence. The introduction of Christianity into Africa also caused severe political strife. Though the European powers introduced several modern institutions in Africa, including the transport system, each of which without including the transport system, health clinics, systems of judiciary, governance and educational system, mechanized road transport systems, each of which without doubt aided the imperial mission. These modern institutions in every nation state of post-colonial Africa were hijacked by the elite and were used to subjugate the rest. Often these institutions conflicted with the existing modes of life. Western institutions such as schools, 
colleges and uh, courts and the government were often viewed as intrusive instruments even as both the colonial and post-colonial administrations privileged them over conventional forms of tribal life. The Western epistemologies subdued the oral memory-based knowledge systems of Africa. The colonial rulers and the elites among the natives very frequently assumed that the majority of the population is intellectually incapable of comprehending modernity or utilizing these institutions well. English literature produced in Africa <coughs> discusses the themes listed above. Several African writers attempted writing novels in English in the 20th century. These include Alan Payton, Chinua Achibi, Bessie Head, Nadim Gordon, M.G. Vasanji, Narudin Farah, J.M. Kudzi, and Wally Soinka. These writers used their novels, short stories, and poems to explore the question of Africa. Chinua Achibi's Things Fall Apart was the first novel written by a native African author to win international acclaim. Soon, several writers from Africa, including uh, writers who wrote essays contextualizing the literary production in Africa, followed Achibe. Most of the prominent critics from Africa, inspired by the theories of Marxism and post-colonialism, began to offer an alternate critique on the African condition, its history and its future. The prominent among these critics were Chinua Achibi, Ngugi Watiango, Simon Gikandi, Neil Lazarus, and Akili Mbembe. All of these writers advocate for and celebrate the decolonization of the African public sphere and contextualize the literary and culturally pro cultural production which is emerging out of the continent amidst constant political changes. While Chinua Achibe offered an impressive critique of Joseph Conrad, Ngugi, through his works such as Decolonizing the Mind, the language of African literature, brought the relationship between language and the politics of epistemology into spotlight. We will discuss the works of Achibe and Ngugi in detail in the subsequent modules. Neil Lazarus explores post-colonial literatures and cultures. Using post-colonial theory, Lazarus examines the dynamics of imperialism, nationalism, and anti-colonial resistance. His work questions issues of capitalist modernity and the effects that globalization has had on the literary and cultural production in Africa. Lazarus has explored these topics and issues in works like Resistance in Postcolonial African Fiction, published in 1990, Nationalism and Cultural Practice in the Postcolonial World, published in 1999, Marxism, Modernity and Postcolonial Studies, published in 2002, The Cambridge Companion to Postcolonial Literary Studies, published in 2004, and The Postcolonial Unconscious, published in 2011. Akili Mbembe, born in Cameroon, writes primarily in French. He is an extremely influential post-colonial critic whose only work in English is the acclaimed On the Post-Colony, published in 2001. Mbembe rejects the idea of post-colonial and instead argues that every ex-colony is now a post-colony. Mbembe views the contemporary state in Africa as a necropolitan system which uses the administrative and governance structures inherited from the col colonists to advance its violent causes. Mbembe argues that the modern state in Africa has gone back on the promises made by the founding fathers. The state is no longer post-colonial in its outlook and functioning, but exists as a post-colony, which has inherited the institutions of violence from its previous co colony self. It uses war machinery, military establishments, and weapons to exploit and destroy its own populations. Such a rule of terror, MMB argues, is used by the nation states in contemporary Africa to subjugate the already emaciated subject. Introduction to Caribbean Prose The Caribbean world consists of over 700 islands, isles and reefs, which are situated in the Caribbean Sea and the North Atlantic Ocean and the surrounding coasts. The region is situated southeast of North America, 
mainland and north and, uh, and north of south africa there are 13 countries and 17 independent territories in the caribbean world since christopher columbus discovered the islands in 1492 various european powers including england france spain portugal italy holland and denmark have ruled over several of these islands the English-speaking nations of the Caribbean islands are collectively called the West Indies. The Caribbean islands are a part of the New World. Since their discovery, these islands bore the brunt of European imperialism. Given that most of these islands are congenial to agriculture and are blessed with sunny weather and abundant rainfall, plantations emerged as the most important source of local economy. Since the climate did not suit the Europeans, the colonial powers began to engage the local population and slaves brought from Africa to work on the plantations. Hence, millions of slaves were transported from Africa to these islands. By the turn of the 18th century, Spain, France and England were the dominant powers in the region. Spain gradually lost its influence and by the 19th century, England and France were the major European players in the Caribbean Sea. In the 19th century, as England and France declared slavery illegal, to sustain the plantation economy, indentured labourers were imported from Asia. However, by then, a huge population of African blacks began to see themselves as the residents of the islands. By the turn of the 20th century, several populations of Africa, South Asian, Chinese and native tribes inhabited the region. Due to colonialism, European modes of education, transport, economy, administration and healthcare were introduced into these islands. English, Spanish and French were used as the official languages on these islands. Since the dawn of the 20th century, several authors, essays and poets have emerged from the Caribbean region. These include C.L.R. James, Errol John, V.S. Naipaul, Derek Walcott, George Lamming, Jean Rees, Edward Brathwaite and Jamaica Kincaid. From the Francophone, French-speaking Caribbean, Aimé Césaire, Edward Glissant and Franz Fanon, emerged as formidable intellectuals. Most of the novelists and poets from the Caribbean region also doubled up as theorists who evaluated and contextualized the work of their peers. Their work offers a critique of the political economy, histories and the decolonization of the islands. Some of the popular theorists from the Caribbean islands that I suggest you look up from the Anglophone Caribbean include C.L.R. James, Gordon Roller, Edward Brathwaite, V.S. Naipaul, Derek Walcott, George Lamming, Kenneth Ramchand, Paul Gilroy. Likewise, from the Francophone nations, please look up the works of Amé Césaire, Edward Lissant and Franz Fanon. In the subsequent modules, we will look up the works of C.L.R. James and Kenneth Ramchand, Gordon Roller and Paul Gilroy in some detail. Introduction to Chinua Achebe's essay Chinua Achebe, besides being rated the best African novelist, is also one of the most highly regarded literary critics of the 20th century. In a career spanning over five decades, H.E.B. authored several essays which touched upon various pertinent issues. These essays, besides throwing light on the checkered history of Africa, explain the effects the dynamics of race, class and religion have had within several nations of Africa. As we have read earlier, H.E.B. is a prolific writer and has written extensively on diverse issues. However, for the sake of representation, we have chosen the anthology Hopes and Impediments, Selected Essays, 1965 to 1987. It is one of the best works to come out of Africa. Through these essays, Achibe argues against generalizing Africans into a monolithic culture. For Achibe, Africa is not to be used as a simple metaphor. In the opening essay of the anthology, which is widely acclaimed, An Image of Africa, Racism in Conrad's Heart of Darkness, Achibe critiques both Joseph Conrad and his Western reader. 
Till the middle of the 20th century, Joseph Conrad's novel, Heart of Darkness, was regarded as a masterpiece and Conrad was considered to, be, to have been sympathetic to the African cause. Achebe demonstrates Conrad's builds on the imperialist visions of Africa and creates a xenophobic image of Africa. He also discusses several notable authors and shares his opinion on the role of writers and writing in cultures. In a contemporary review, Chris Dunton argued, the essays in this book remind us how tough-minded, how properly insistent Achebe can be in exposing faults and demeaning ideas about Africa and its culture. Through the 15 essays included in the anthology, Achebe discusses several case causes including the problem that came up as the North-South engage, impediments to dialogue between North and South, and the role of the novelist in the Third World in the essays such as the novelist as teacher and the writer and his community. The essay, The Novelist as Teacher, consists of two parts. In the first part, Achebe argues that the work of art exists in relation to its readers. Drawing on his personal experience, Achebe lists out the functions of authors in society. He states that unlike the European authors, African writers need to write for African readership and argue that they need to be organic and also function as a guide and teacher to the readers. Achebe also throws light on the culture of Africa and contextualized contemporary writing emerging from the continent. Through articles such as the Igbo world and its art, thoughts on the African novel, Achebe brings to foreground the facts that art of Igbo population closely reflects the lives and beliefs of the people. Since the Igbo population and its culture are non-permanent and are always in motion, the art reflects the same. He transcribes Igbo words. The theme of universalism versus parochialism is a recurrent theme in most of Achebe's writing. For instance, in the essay Thoughts on the African Novel, Achebe argues that the idea that the African novel has to be about Africa, he says that such an assumption po poses a pretty serious restriction on the author and the reader. For Achebe, Africa does not exist as, uh, as a geographical expression alone, but is also a metaphysical landscape. Based on its complex history, Achebe argues that the African literature can represent the view of the world and perceives the whole world from its particular perspective. Introduction to N. Gugi Vatiango. Ngugi Wa Thiango emerged as one of the most influential post-colonial voices from Africa, like Achebe. He is a public intellectual and his works deal with diverse issues. We will discuss the, uh, Wa Thiango's Decolonizing the Mind, the Politics of Language in African Literature in this lesson. It is a collection of non-fiction essays which discusses issues such as language, ideology, national culture, history and identity and its publication established Vatiango as one of the most prominent theorists on issues such as language debates. Ngugi Mel's autobiography, post-colonial theory, pedagogy, African history and literary criticism to effectively articulate his ideas on language, culture, memory and politics. He dedicates decolonizing the mind to those who write in the African languages and vernaculars across and to those who over the years have maintained the dignity of the literature, culture, philosophy and other treasures carried by African languages. For Ngogi, the role of language goes beyond communicating thought. It is the essence of the human being and acts as a repository of thought and history. It is the medium of memories and provides the link between space and time and is the basis of African dreams. Ngogi was vocal against the imposition of European languages and as a protest began to write in the vernacular. His mode was not a reaction against anglicization but aimed at resurrecting the African soul from centuries of slavery and colonialism. He believed that Africa's encounter with the West left it spiritually and economically exploited. For Ngogi, colonialism resulted in the linguicide of Africa. This killing of the language resulted in Africans attempting to adopt foreign languages and this resulted in its population inescapable of accessing their cultures and memories. Ngugi calls this phenomenon a death wish that occurs in societies that have never fully acknowledged their loss like a trauma victim who resorts to drugs to kill the pain. 
It should not be thought that Ngugi is for the exclusive promotion of the vernacular languages. He is a votary of multilingual societies and believes that there are be better places to deal with the complexities of the world. He urges that parents, schools and societies need to encourage the use of vernacular languages among the younger generation even as they are exposed to foreign languages. His work is relevant today and has influenced a whole generation of post-colonial thinkers. It has ramifications in spheres besides literature and theory and is widely used by political activists to create inclusive, pluralistic and tolerant cultures. Introduction to the ideas of C.L.R. James and Kenneth Ramchand In this module, we will examine the writing of C.L.R. James and Kenneth Ramchand. Cyril Lionel Robert James was popularly called C.L.R. James and he was the first noted essayist in English to have emerged from the Caribbean region. C.L.R. James, a leading theorist of decolonization in 20th century, is in many ways a precursor of some of the Caribbean's best-known literatures, including Amy Ferdinand, David Césaire, Franz Fanon and Edward Glissant. However, Césaire, Glissant and Fanon wrote in French. Though James, a first-rate writer, was, uh, has authored texts on diverse issues ranging from the history of the islands, called Black Jacobians, Cricket, uh, claimed, uh, uh, the acclaimed Beyond a Boundary, Governance, Every Cook Can Govern, and several treatises on Marxism and decolonization. I suggest that you read Fanon's influential works such as Black Skins, White Masks, A Dying Colonialism and The Wretched of the Earth. The ideas that Fanon propounded in these works resonate across the world. In this module, we briefly discuss James's essay, Discovering Literature in Trinidad, Two Experiences. The essay, often anthologized, is uh, succinct and provocative and provides us an idea of the tradition of literature in the Caribbean world. James states that till the 1930s, the literature produced in the West Indies mirrored that which was produced elsewhere. He also states that the careers of the writers were largely affected by the dynamics of race and class. He wrote this essay in 1969 and very briefly comments on the works of Earl Lovelace and Michael Antony, whom he deemed as a new type of West Indian writer. Lovelace and Anthony, James states, are not writing with all the echoes and traditions of English literature in their mind. As I see them, they are mature writers in the sense that their prose and the things that they are dealing with spring from below. James argues that they do not see life through a European educated literary sieve. Trinidad born novelist Kenneth Ramchand, who came a generation later than James, is perhaps the first celebrated literary chronicler to have emerged out of the post colonial Caribbean islands. He is the author of the widely read The West Indian Novel and its background in 1972, juxtaposing the writings of the second generation West Indian writers, including John Hearn and Roger Mice, with their predecessors. Kenneth Ramchand makes the following points. He argues that the earliest of the West Indian writers sought European precedents which were not always appropriate to the Caribbean context. Hence, the West Indian intellectual, artist or academic is so unsure of relevant values. Ramchand argued that the second generation of Caribbean novelists deliberately experimented with the form, including the plot and characters of the novel. This experimentation makes most of the Caribbean writers adopt a modernist outlook. These authors, however, do not experiment for the sake of experimentation, but to reflect the Caribbean reality, including its ambivalent relationship with the metropolis and the historical anxiety that it faces. Ramchand's analysis of the characters in the West Indian novel buttresses his claim. Most of the characters are largely formless. The authors make their characters deliberately formless, not because they are incapable of fleshing out well-rounded or developed characters, but because they want these characters to reflect the formlessness of the West Indian society. He argues that the existential position of the individual in the society is such that a pattern does not seem to, re to be relevant and comes spontaneous to the writer from the West Indies. Ramchand has also gone on to argue that it is not productive to compare Caribbean writers with European or English writers. He reminds us that the novel becomes an accessible text for the working class only through the 19th century. The liberated slave in the Caribbean, Ramchand points out, is a cultural void. He does not have a precursor in history. Most West Indian writers of the 19th and 20th century sought to address this cultural void by deeming Europe their home. 
Ramchand also points out that for the second generation Caribbean writers, unlike the European counterparts, social consciousness is not class, class consciousness. Instead, the West Indian writers produce literature based on the larger Caribbean society. Ramchand's work has inspired several con contemporary literary productions. Uh, Gordon Roller, a colleague of Ramchand, analyzed the oral culture in the Caribbean, that is the culture of the Calypso. And the works of Paul Gilroy and Gordon Roller can be seen as emerging out of Ramchand's work. Introduction to Paul Gilroy and Gordon Roller. Gordon Roller, a Guanese born writer, is one of the first Caribbean academics to have theorized oral literature from the West Indies, abandoning the apologist stance that first generation Caribbean writers exhibit vis a vis popular culture. Roller indicated most of his career in theorizing the popular text, including Calypso music and individual uh, calypsos, cricket literature, short stories, and oral stories. Uh, the Calypso is, uh, can be traced to West African music traditions and over the centuries was influenced by French beats and Caribbean Creole. A typical Calypso is a beat poem which is sung to a tune. As Roller demonstrate, Calypso was useful as a tool for political mobilization during the anti-colonial struggles and it acted as a carrier of nationalism and functioned as a source of collective memory on the islands. It is used by the West Indians to valorize their fellow men and document everyday life as well as to commemorate special locations. Gordon Roller contextualizes the Caribbean cultural production with political transformations in the background. Roller also theorized the lives and works of his worthy predecessors and luminous contemporaries including James Wilson Harris, Naipaul, George Lamin and Kamau Brathwaite. Paul Gilroy was born in London to Guanese parents. In his works, introduced the themes of Afrocentrism. Through his works, There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack, 1787, Small Acts, 1993 and Black Atlantic, 1993. Between Camps 2000, Gilroy has demonstrated that the Caribbean intellectuals need to re-examine the new world's relationship with Africa. We will be discussing Gilroy's idea of the double consciousness as demonstrated in the Black Atlantic in the subsequent model. Double consciousness was first proposed by W. E. D. Du Bois in The Souls of Black Folk. Du Bois used the term to describe the Afro-Americans' experience of always looking at oneself through the eyes of a racist white society. The black community which is disadvantaged strives to measure itself through by, by the measure of the nation that looked back in contempt at it. Gilroy's work, The Black Atlantic, Modernity and Double Consciousness, is an important contribution to the study of African diaspora. Gilroy deems the Black Atlantic as a transnational cultural construction, which is an inclusive space and argues that populations that suffered from the slave trade across the Atlantic constitute a diaspora. His efforts have resulted in widening the idea of diaspora, which until 2000 was comprehended as people who are separated by a communal source or origin. Drawing on Du Bois' work, Gilroy's theme of double consciousness demonstrates how the constituents of the Black Atlantic are coerced to be both European and Black simultaneously. To sum up, we have looked at some of the key players in the area of African and Caribbean writing. We have examined in detail their major works and concepts. For more information, look at the e-text. Thank you.